Y'all love the weather the last two days? It's been wonderful, I think. <laughs> um, I have a few announcements for you today. Um, on behalf of the nominating committee, there are still some positions available, and they are Sunday School Director. They're looking for either one person or two who would like to split that responsibility up. Also, someone to serve on Budget and Finance Committee and someone to be the chair of that committee. We also need a teacher for the three-year-old to kindergarten class just one Sunday a month. So if you feel led to fill any of those positions, you can contact Ms. Mary Ann, and her number is on the announcement sheet, which are out on the white tables at each entrance. Also today at five o'clock, we do have a business meeting here in Braswell Hall, and we'll be voting on the nominating committee, um, their list for the new church year. So be sure to be here for that. And also, play rehearsal will happen tomorrow night. <clears throat> we're, we're sure of it this time. Poor Miss Beverly got sick last week, so it had to be canceled. But <clears throat> tomorrow night at 7, here in Braswell Hall, there will be play rehearsal for anyone who would like to be involved. And there are parts for anyone. She needs people that can help move things on and off the stage, um, people backstage. And if you don't really like the idea of being up here speaking in front of people, there are parts available where you don't even have to speak. Your presence on stage will just be felt. So um, be sure to contact her if you have any questions or just come tomorrow night just to see what it's all about. And anyone is welcome. And also, next Sunday, we have a very special service. Um, we're going to have our normal worship service, but at the end, the Carlottis are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, and they're going to renew their vows after our service. I think that's great. So be sure to be here next week for that. And that's all I've got for you. But be sure you can pick up this sheet and the prayer list um, at any of the entrances if you'd like to take one home with you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have the kids' corner. Kids, y'all want to come down here and sit on the steps? You want to, John? You don't? They don't want to. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk to you anyway. My question is, and I want to hear it, what is the difference between a sheep and a goat? You did? <laughs> Well, Siri, Siri has no idea. <laughs> that was perfect. That was perfect. Okay. Uh, that reminds me I need to turn mine off, too. Uh, okay. What is the difference between a sheep and a goat? The, if you look at a picture, sometimes it's hard to see. The main difference is that a goat's tail goes up and a sheep's tail goes down. A second thing is if they have horns, the sheep's horn, like the big horn sheep up in the mountains uh, of Colorado and all, they, they're curved, whereas a goat's horns are just kind of straight or, or at an angle. And the big thing is that, that sheep have wool that is all fluffy that has to be sheared uh, every year and, and more than that. And a goat's hair is usually just straight. So that's the difference. Now do you know how Jesus tells the difference between sheep and goats? This, this is what he said. When I come back the second time, we're waiting for Jesus to return. And he says, when I return, I will sit on the throne of, and all the nations will be gathered before me. I will separate the people like a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. The sheep he will put on his right hand and the goats on his left hand. And then he will say to those on his right, I was thirsty and you fed me. 
I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was uh, naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the righteous people on the right said, when did we do that? And Jesus told them, it is much as you did it unto these, you have done it unto me. And then he turned to the unrighteous on his left, and he said, you didn't feed me when I was hungry. You didn't give me a drink when I was thirsty. You didn't invite me in when I was a stranger. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't, didn't visit me. And the ones on the left will say, well, when did we not do all of those things? And he said, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help one of the least of these brethren, you refuse to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Now, the point of, the, of this lesson by Jesus was not that if you do a lot of things for people, you'll go to heaven. That's not the point. The point is, if we truly love Jesus and he belongs to us and we belong to him, then we will love those around us. That's the point. Okay? Let me go through our prayer uh, list. Uh, remember Betty Anderson and also Joe Gurley. I talked to Greg yesterday and she's got two more weeks of this radiation and uh, two more chemos. Uh, continue to pray for Kay uh, Mitchell. She's still having a little pain getting used to this. Uh, remember James Bedford. Uh, Tony Polygonis has been pretty sick, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, also, James Hester. Um, oh, Paulette, Paulette Pittman. Uh, also, Marshall, keep Marshall in your prayers. He had to go back to the emergency room again this week. Uh, Shelby McGallier, uh, David Braswell, continue to remember his elbow. And, um, and Beverly Wallace uh, will be getting results from tests tomorrow as well. So remember each of those. Can I say something? Yeah. <laughs> Praise because. 
Father. Jesus loves us so very much. May we love each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for being here today. We're going to look at the book of Nahum today. Uh, probably never heard a sermon. I don't know that I've ever preached a sermon on Nahum. But um, we're going to this morning. So look at this passage in the first chapter. A prophecy concerning Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power. The Lord will not have leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind. And the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence. The world and all who live in it. Who can understand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. His, the rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end to Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be estranged from thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. <coughs> For you, Nineveh, has one come, from you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have inflicted, afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. He will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your God. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely completely destroyed. story is told of a farmer out there in the Midwest who had a, a strong disdain for Christianity. He plowed his fields on Sunday morning. He would shake his fist at church people as they passed him by. October came and the farmer had his most abundant crop that he had ever had. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it 
Anyway, <coughs> so Chuck was going to the drainage. I guess any of y'all have any of that. Uh, anyway, he placed an ad in the local newspaper and it belittled Christians and for having faith in their God. And he, as he closed the ad, he said, faith in God must not mean much if somebody like me can prosper. The response for the Christian community at large was quiet and polite. One of them put an ad in the paper that said simply, God doesn't always settle his accounts in October. <laughs> it was time, says the prophet Nahum, for God to punish Nineveh, the capital of the nation of Assyria, which is modern day northern Iraq. If you like history like I do, go to the internet and pull up Nineveh. It is interesting. They have it, that city was settled 6,000 years before Christ. It, it is old, old. <coughs> Today, it is, the ruins were finally discovered outside of Mosul, which is where many of our troops went and fought and died in the Iraq war. But they were extremely wicked against God Almighty. And that's the theme of this Old Testament prophet Nahum. Since the city of Nineveh had been made by the Assyrian king Sennacherib, the capital of Assyria, they had become the very symbol of treachery and oppression of all the Hebrew people. <coughs> Sorry. I've, I've got to go. It was built to endure forever. Located on the eastern banks of the Tigris River, fortified with walls and moats, the walls of Nineveh were seven and a half miles around, and they were wide enough for three chariots to ride abreast. For God to take his vengeance upon this wicked city, he really needed to do a lot. Now, if you remember, God had used the nation of Assyria to punish the northern kingdom of Assyria. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. In 2 Kings 17, it shows how in 722 B.C., Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, came and destroyed Samaria and carried all the Israelites in the northern kingdom away to the Tigris Valley and settled them there, bringing people they had conquered back to northern Palestine who later by the time of Jesus were called the Samaritans. Nahum lived a hundred years after that and by then Assyria was no longer useful to God. <coughs> they never acknowledged God. that God had been with them and used them to become the power of the world. The beginning of the end for the nation of Assyria was when the Assyrian king, King Sennacherib, attacked Jerusalem 150 years after his predecessor had destroyed Samaria and defied the living God with blasphemous language. You're going to read about that in 2 Kings 18 and 2 Chronicles 32. Hezekiah, king of Judah, and Isaiah the prophet prayed for God to take care of Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us that that night, God sent his angel to the Assyrian army's camp 
and 150,000 Assyrian soldiers died. Sennacherib then went back to Nineveh and was later assassinated by his sons. From that day on, Assyria began to crumble. And as Nahum had prophesied in 612 B.C., Babylon, with their alliance of other nations, came in and totally destroyed Nineveh. The city was wiped clean from the face of the earth. By the 16th century A.D., the, a lot of biblical scholars wanted to drop Nahum and Jonah from the Old Testament because there was no evidence that Nineveh had ever existed. And then in 1846, Assyrians, discover, uh, uh, archaeologists, discovered the city of Nineveh. And sure enough, it was as large as Jonah and Nahum said it was. When Alexander the Great marched with Greece against the Persians 300 years later, they marched right over the city and didn't even know it was there. There was a battle fought by the Greeks and the Persians on the site of Nineveh, and they didn't even know that a city had been there. God had destroyed the people of Nineveh and the city just like he had prophesied. Nahum's name means the comforter, the counselor, the bringer of consolation. He was a native of Elkish that we're not really sure where it was. Many scholars believe it was Capernaum and, and because that means city of Nahum. The prophet Nahum gives expression in this small Old Testament book that the universe is so constituted that kingdoms built upon force and military might and fraud must eventually collapse. Whereas the kingdom of God reared on the foundation of truth and righteousness must ultimately triumph. In the destruction of Nineveh, the moral government of the universe, God himself, was vindicated. The nations of our world need to take note of that today. <coughs> I'm going to keep coughing again. The principle is, principle is brought out in this first chapter. There's a time coming when the Lord will be a refuge, a stronghold for those who trust Him, but will crush and be an overrunning flood to those who rebel against Him. That this is emphatically represented by the prophecy of Nahum. For the two opposite types of character he mentions, the Lord has two lines of divine providence. The first type of character is a one who is a friend of God. This character depends wholly upon the Lord their God as their refuge and their stronghold. This character looks to the Lord in times of need and in times of plenty knowing that it is the Lord who delivers them every the universal character of a friend of God is all ages that they trust Him for all things. They trust His love to always provide for them, His wisdom to be their infallible guide in life, and His power as their strength and shield. So is the trust of God's friend. Verse 7 ends by saying about the friend of God that God knows them and they know Him and trust Him. 
The friend of God was typified by Nahum here in this chapter as Judah under the rule of good king Hezekiah, led by the prophet Isaiah, following the Lord devoutly all of his life, trusting in the Lord's deliverance, even from that menacing Assyrian army. God knows his freedom. The second type of character is the one who is an enemy of God. Those who pursue a course of life directly opposed to the moral laws of heaven are God's enemies. And verse 8 ends by saying, and darkness will pursue his enemies. All through the Bible, you can see those who wandered away from God. One of the first examples was Cain, who refused to bring a good sacrifice that God required and wound up committing the first of humanity's murder by killing his brother. In the Exodus, Pharaoh was an enemy to God. Not only did he enslave God's people, but he claimed for himself that he was a God equal to the Hebrews' God. All through the Bible and into secular history, those who have opposed God have fallen. In A.D. 303, Roman Emperor Diocletian issued an edict to destroy all of Christianity. The persecution by the Roman government against Christians was extreme. And over a burned Bible, Emperor Diocletian built a monument which he wrote these words. The name Christian is extinguished. 25 years later, Diocletian was dead and the new Roman Emperor Constantine declared Rome a Christian state. In 1776, French philosopher, French philosopher uh, Voltaire announced that within a hundred years, Christianity would cease and the word of God would never be read again. A hundred years later, Voltaire was dead and his own house and printing press were being used to print and store Bibles by the Geneva Bible Society and Christianity was flourishing. Throughout history, people have made themselves God's enemies and his darkness has overcome them. And of course, for the prophet Nahum, God's enemy was Assyria and the city of Nineveh. Their king Sennacherib had uttered curses and blasphemies against Almighty God and they became God's enemies. So we see that in this world there are two types of character. The one is good and trusts God and is God's freedom. And the Lord acknowledges them. The other is evil and self-gratifying. And they have made themselves the enemies of God. So as there are two opposite characters, so there are two opposite lines of divine opposition. On one, God becomes Savior, and on the other, He becomes Judge. The friend, to the friend of God, He provides protection and salvation. When the host of Sennacherib were approaching Jerusalem, King Hezekiah, under divine inspiration, told his people this, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid or dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude with him. For they be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves 
upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Second Chronicles 32. God is always the refuge and strength of his people in times of trouble and in times of peace as well. As a refuge, God is ever accessible. However storm, uh, suddenly the storm may come upon us, the refuge of the Lord is by our side and his door is always open. He is ever our security and once entered, no injury can follow. We can also apply this truth to our lives as followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament book of Job, Job cries out, Is there no mediator who can stand before the Almighty for me? Yes, Job, there is. Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father, is our mediator. Between God and humanity, there is a deep chasm, a chasm caused by sin. There's no way for humankind to cross over to God because the chasm caused by sin is so great. And yet provision was made by Jesus who spanned the chasm by his death, burial, and resurrection. We can now have fellowship with the Father. God becomes our friend. He becomes our Savior through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. But the one who opposes God, becoming God's enemy, the divine procedure is only judgment and destruction. Sennacherib failed, Nineveh failed, the nation of Assyria failed because they became God's enemy. On a crowded seat street in one of our cities, a young man was snatched from the path of a speeding truck, his life saved by a very stately looking man. Still breathless from fright, the young man thanked the one who had saved his life and then they were separated by an overwhelming crowd. Several weeks later, in a crowded courtroom, an anxious young man stood at the defendant's table to be sentenced for murder. The judge said, young man, have you anything to say before the sentence is passed upon you? The young man responded, why yes, yes judge, you know me. A silence moved like a shockwave through the courtroom. The judge said, I'm sorry, I can't place you. And the defendant said, yes, sure, you remember me. Several weeks ago at Main and 7th Street, you saved my life. Surely you can do something now to save the judge. Silence again filled the courtroom. And this is what the judge told the young man. Young man, now I do remember you. That day I was your savior, but today I am your judge. The Old Testament prophet Nahum declared that the city of Nineveh and the nation of Assyria would be destroyed because they had made themselves God's enemies. But because of King Hezekiah's faith, good tidings belong to the nation of Judah because God was their freedom. My prayer today is that you are the Lord's freedom and not his enemy. Friendship and salvation is, is possible in our world of self-centeredness and the idolatry of materialism only by faith in God's provision, our Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, chapter 20, we're told that God holds two books 
in one every deed we have and will do, every thought we have and ever will have is in that book. In the other book is the name of every person who has ever lived on this earth who by faith have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If your name is not in that second book, the Lamb's Book of Life, then that first book declares your judgment. Listen to Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and he who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in those books. The sea gave up the dead and that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead, the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone's name who was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This morning, are you a friend of God because of your repentance and your confession by faith that Jesus Christ is your Savior? If so, God is your Savior. But if you have rejected God's grace and are living your life for yourself and your desires, then God is your enemy and He will be your judge. Hear the main message of God's holy word from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Love the Lord your God with all of your soul, with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all your strength and your neighbor as yourself, then you will be the friend of God. That's the invitation to you today. Receive God's salvation as his friend. Because, Lord, folks, the majority of this world are the enemies of God. And they will face judgment. Father, thank you again for these powerful words from the Old Testament that speak to our hearts and let us know that you are a God of vengeance upon those who blaspheme you and, and reject you and live for themselves. But for those who follow you, Lord, through faith in Jesus our Lord, you are their Savior. Lord, I just thank you that Jesus loves us that much, that he would give himself for our sin on the cross. Thank you, Father, for raising him on the third day, that we might have hope of everlasting life. Lord, we've all had friends and family members who've gone on to be with you. And one day, Lord, we know that each of us will go that same path. Our prayer, Father, is that you will just make sure that each of us will make sure that our names are in that Lamb's Book of Life through our faith in Jesus. Lord, thank you for this time that we can spend together. Bless us as we serve you together at Rosewood First Baptist. In Jesus' name we pray.